right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I think it's Tuesday. All right, just a few things on the top, top here, and then I'll get right to your questions. Uh, as we announced yesterday, Secretary Austin will depart this Friday for a trip to both Japan and the Philippines. This will be his 11th visit to the Indo-Pacific region as Secretary of Defense. In Tokyo, the Secretary will participate in the 2024 U.S.-Japan Security Consultative Committee and a historic trilateral ministerial meeting with Japan and South Korea. He'll also meet with senior Japanese officials. In Manila, Secretary Austin and Secretary of State Antony Blinken will participate in the fourth U.S.-Philippines 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue with their Philippine counterparts. The trip underscores the U.S. commitment to strengthening alliances in the Indo-Pacific region for peace and stability. And following his return from the Indo-Pacific, Secretary Austin and Secretary Blinken will host their Australian counterparts in Annapolis, Maryland on August 6 for the 2024 Australia-U.S. Ministerial Consultations. We'll have much more to provide on the Secretary's upcoming trip and the Australia-U.S. Ministerial Consultations in the near future. Separately, Secretary Austin hosted Estonian Minister of Defense Hanno Pevkur here at the Pentagon earlier today to discuss a range of regional and bilateral issues. The discussions underscored the importance of maintaining NATO alliance unity and countering Russian aggression in Ukraine. The two leaders also emphasized the need to strengthen NATO's credible deterrence and defense, highlighting the importance of continued joint exercises to enhance interoperability and efficiency between military forces. Additionally, they discussed the U.S. commitment to a persistent rotational presence in the Baltics, increased defense production to support Ukraine and replenish allied munitions and equipment stocks, and the outcomes of the recent Washington-NATO summit. A readout of the meeting will be posted to the DOD website. Secretary Austin also spoke by phone today with Ukrainian Minister of Defense Rustem Umarov. During the call, the Secretary reaffirmed the unwavering support of the United States for Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression. The two leaders also discussed the outcomes of the NATO summit in Washington and the steps allies are taking to support Ukraine. Minister Umarov provided Secretary Austin an update of dynamics on the ground in Ukraine as Ukraine's forces bravely continue to fight Russian aggression. A readout will be posted to defense.gov later today. And finally, the 2024 U.S.-Iraq Joint Security Cooperation Dialogue concludes today after two days of senior-level working group meetings and dialogue exchange focused on both nations' commitment to strengthening our important bilateral strategic relationship. Secretary Austin will host Iraqi Minister of Defense Tabit al-Abbasi in the Pentagon this afternoon to discuss the U.S.-Iraq bilateral defense relationship and the efforts of the Joint Security Cooperation Dialogue and Higher Military Commission. We'll provide readouts of both of these as soon as they become available. And with that, glad to take your questions. I know we've got AP on the phone, so we'll go to Tarakop. Hello, thank you. Um, I wanted to know if Secretary Austin will be sitting in on any meetings between Netanyahu and White House officials this week, and if uh, any discussions are on the table about increased uh, weapons for Israel, either offensive Western weapons in Gaza or increased defense weapons like for Iron Dome. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tara. I, I don't have any meetings to read out at this time uh, If with the secretary uh, and the, the prime minister. If that changes, certainly we'll, we'll let you know. Uh, and nothing to announce, announce at this time in terms of any um, security, additional security assistance uh, or increased uh, FMS. Is okay. the 2,000 pound bomb still held up? Is that still the one shipment that has not been sent to Israel? Correct. There's the, the one shipment of 2,000 pound bombs that is uh, still um, paused. Right, go to Idris. Just on the Iraq uh, meeting between Iraq and U.S. officials, is there a sort of goal to have some sort of agreement by the end of the meetings, um, by the end of the visit by the Iraqi minister um, on the transition away from the coalition to a bilateral relationship? Or is that something that doesn't need to happen um, as a result of the meetings? Yeah, so uh, again, we'll have a, a readout in terms of the outcomes of the uh, the joint security cooperation dialogue. And, and really, as we've talked about before, so kind of two separate things all interrelated. Uh, the, the JSCD, I have to use an acronym because this is the DOD, um, is as a forum by where we can uh, discuss our bilateral 
security relationship. Uh, of course, the Higher Military Commission uh, was created out of last year's Joint Security Cooperation Dialogue. Uh, and so it, really what they do, Idris, is they provide a forum to discuss not only our bilateral security relationship, but in the context of the coalition in Iraq, uh, what the transition of that will look like going forward. Uh, so right now, I don't have anything to read out in terms of decisions or, or timelines. But of course, you know, recognizing that that is a continued topic of interest, we'll be sure to keep you updated on that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, General Patrick. So is the purpose of the discussion with, with Iraqis at uh, this building to end the role of the coalition, the national coalition? Um, well, again, you know, uh, just if you go back to um, Prime Minister Sudani's visit uh, to Washington, D.C. earlier this year, they, they affirmed uh, that we would review the factors to determine when and how the mission of the global coalition in Iraq would end and tr transition in an orderly manner to ensure uh, or to an enduring bilateral security partnership. Uh, this is all, of course, in accordance with Iraq's constitution and the U.S.-Iraq Strategic Framework Agreement of 2008. So uh, the Higher Military Commission is uh, looking at that transition, what that will look like in the context of, of the threat that ISIS pose, operational uh, considerations as well as Iraqi security forces capacity uh, and so again nothing to announce right now we'll be sure to keep you updated on this one, one more don't mind on ISIS <coughs> recently Suncom uh, released it is six months activities in both Iraq and uh, Syria including Kurdistan region that in conducted 196 operations against ISIS and on the contrary ISIS launched 153 attacks in both uh, countries so in the discussions did you consider the, the threats of ISIS? You know, uh, with, w again, without previewing uh, the readout, I mean, certainly, I mean, this is a, a core function of this group is to look at uh, the threat that ISIS poses to the region uh, and also with the eye towards I Iraq's important role when it comes to regional stability. Thank you, Thank you very much. Tom? Hi, Hi Gerald. Uh, thanks um, for doing this. It's quite wordy, isn't it, the descriptions that you're coming up with? Um, in terms of the uh, the transition in an orderly manner to ensure an enduring bilateral security partnership. Can you put that more in layman's terms? Like, what is a bilateral security partnership if not troops? Um, well, first of all, the global coalition uh, is more than just the United States and Iraq, right? CJTFOIR represents, um, you know, dozens and dozens of countries that have come together to address the threat of ISIS. Uh, and so, what we're talking about here is the transition of the coalition, which again is more than just the United States, but also through the Joint Security Cooperation Dialogue with an eye towards the U.S.-Iraq bilateral security relationship. What does that relationship look like? So that's what I'm talking about. And I do appreciate the commentary on my wordy responses. The security partnership, could that continue with U.S. troops on the ground or is that? Well, I think, uh, again, the, the U.S.-Iraq bilateral security relationship is one thing and the uh, global coalition uh, which is U.S. led right now in uh, in the region uh, what does that look like going forward A again taking into account the three factors that I highlighted okay so I, all right I didn't really hear an answer there but it's okay like so in terms of the in terms of sorry to beat a dead horse here with the U.S. Iraq bilateral security agreement could that include a remote continuing presence of American troops? Well, again, I don't want to get ahead of the process. That That's the discussions that are ongoing is what would that relationship look like under the auspices of the uh, security or the strategic framework agreement um, going forward? So again, I, you know, it's a very well put question, very eloquently stated. I just can't answer it. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> last week, General Brown said the in response to the uh, to the attack in in Iraq, um, which the Pentagon attributed to an Iran-backed group, he said that the U.S. would respond at a time and place of, of its choosing. Previously, you guys have said we reserve the right to do so. Does that mean can we interpret that as a decision has been made that the U.S. will respond? Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks for the question, Joseph. So, you know, I'm not going to forecast or telegraph any potential future operations. I think what the chairman was saying, and, and he's right, is that we always reserve the right to respond at a time and place of our choosing and that we will put the protection of our forces uh, first and foremost, the safety of our forces. So I'll just leave it there. And then secondly, um, the Yemen's Houthis this morning have put out a new uh, list of targets that they may um, attack in Israel. <laughs> Among them includes the what they say is the port of Ashdod, where the U.S. has uh, transitioned the, the Gaza Pier to the port of Ashdod for humanitarian aid. Are you, one, are you guys taking these threats seriously? Two, is there any concern that uh, any U.S. assets could be in danger? Apart from the, the Red Sea, obviously, that's attacks that have been going on. Uh, so a couple things. So I think is uh, demonstrated by our actions in the region. Um, we're absolutely taking uh, any Houthi threats seriously and continue to work with allies and partners to degrade and disrupt their capability to launch attacks uh, in the Red Sea uh, and in the in the region. Um, as it relates to you know the potential impact on U.S. forces, as I just highlighted, we'll take all necessary measures to ensure that our forces are protected uh, and take appropriate actions. Uh, but again, I won't get into potential future just actions. Quickly, um, sources have, s have told us that the U.S. shot down either drones or missiles as part of the Houthi attack on Tel Aviv, where one drone obviously got through. Can you confirm or deny that the U.S. shot down any or, or helped in the self-defense? Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to provide beyond what CENTCOM has already put out in their daily CENTCOM updates. Um, so just leave it there. Let me just go to the phone here real quick. Uh, WTOP, J.J. Green. Yeah, General, thank you for this opportunity. Um, earlier today, BBC reported NATO Chief Stoltenberg said that Europe should be prepared for a decade of war. Um, in in Ukraine, um, a decade of war is. I'm not sure that um, the West is prepared for that, but uh, I'm wondering um, how far, how long is the Pentagon prepared to stand by Ukraine, considering this the statement and the 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 conditions on the ground. Yeah, thanks, JJ. Well, I I think uh, you know our our leadership has been clear on this, that we're going to stand by Ukraine. We're going to support their security and their, their inherent right to defend themselves. Uh, of course, no one wants to see this war continue. Uh, but as long as Russia continues to occupy sovereign Ukrainian territory, and as long as the Ukrainians continue uh, to fight against Russian aggression uh, and for freedom, uh, the United States will continue to support, as we've done since the beginning of Russia's illegal invasion. And as you've heard Secretary Austin say, you know, Ukraine matters. The, the security of Ukraine matters because if Russia is allowed to succeed in Ukraine, they won't stop there. Uh, and so this is, of course, of vital importance in terms of not only European security, but U.S. and international security. Thank you. Come back there. Yes, ma'am. Uh, back to the Iraqi and U.S. bilateral meeting. Um, during the process of estimation to, to determine the, the capability of the Iraqi forces, uh, uh, do you think that now it's time to have the U.S. troops withdrawal from Iraq based on the capability of the Iraqi forces now? Well, again, I, I won't get ahead of the the discussions within the Higher Military Commission uh, and, and their recommendations to the senior leaders of both of uh, our countries, Iraq and the United States. Uh, so again, uh, we'll continue to keep you updated on that front. Uh, the United States is committed to having a continuing bilateral security cooperation relationship with Iraq. Uh, we are fully supportive of Iraq and its important role in regional stability uh, and greatly respect Iraq as a partner and also uh, respect Iraq's sovereignty. So again, we'll have much more to provide in the, the near future. Sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is that uh, after uh, President Biden's announcement that uh, he's no longer running for the second term and he fully endorsed and supported the Vice President Kamala Harris for the uh, presidential or for the party's nomination. My question is that, number one, U.S. never had a female president or commander-in-chief 
if this building or military is ready for a female commander in chief and two if secretary is getting any messages from around the globe as far as this announcement is concerned how they feel about this maybe us will have a female president yeah thanks for the question uh, as i'm sure you can appreciate i'm not going to get into political campaigns from here uh, the pentagon of course uh, will always support the commander in chief as elected by the people of the united states uh, and so i'll just leave it there thanks very much sir Thank you, General. How is the Pentagon observing the ongoing student protests in Bangladesh, where mass killings are being carried out by security forces under shoot on sight orders from the ruling Prime Minister? Hundreds have been killed and thousands injured. The internet has been shut down and nationwide curfew been declared. People are demanding the resignation of the Prime Minister and the military is on the street. Security forces are using UN marked uh, armored personal vehicle, which has been condemned by the UN. So what is your observation? Yeah, sure. Uh, of course, we're continuing to monitor the, the ongoing situation there. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, to, to uh, echo what, what my colleagues uh, at State Department have said is that we would call for calm uh, and certainly don't want to see continued uh, violence. So. Um, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. If I may, mm -hmm. as U.S. is the largest uh, donor for the peacekeeping support to the U.N., and those individuals who are violating extreme, involved in extreme violation of human rights in their own country, they are deploying to the U.N. peacekeeping mission. So what is your observation? Those who are not able to maintain peace in their own country, how can they? Can yeah, again, I, I don't have much to provide from the podium here other than, again, you know, we obviously don't want to see violence increase. Uh, we, have, we, of course, uh, want there to be calm and, and uh, recognition of, of human rights. Uh, and so I'll just leave it there, sir. Thank sir. you, General. Um, Greek government minister Georgiadis said on television the other day that um, they might raid the Turkish capital with the F-35s that they're going to acquire from the United States. Would you say that such statements from one NATO ally to the other are nothing but irresponsible? I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. You said that at 35 that they're going to acquire from the United States that, that they might raid the Turkish capital. That those F-35s might appear suddenly one night in Turkey. Um, so how would you evaluate that um, statement? Would you say that that's irresponsible from one NATO ally to the other? Yeah, I, I, haven't, from the US? I haven't seen that out there. Um, so I don't have a comment other than you know, again, we, we would always want our NATO allies to, to work together and um, would not condone violence. Um, so historically, the United States has kept a fine balance in providing defense equipment to the Turks and the Greek. Would you say that that balance has been tipped in one size favor because it's making one, one of the NATO allies, those two, uh, making them talk about, you know, cap about the capabilities that they haven't even Acquired. Yeah, like it's the first of the race going to take years. Um, so, so what I would say uh, is, first of all, when it comes to the relationship between Greece and Turkey, I'd let Greece and Turkey talk to uh, talk to you and characterize the relationship. I would say, from where we sit, we certainly value uh, our partnership and alliance with both Turkey and Greece, and and certainly appreciate the efforts that have gone into addressing some of the areas of mutual concern, uh, and. I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. Ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am. <laughs> Janie, how are you? <laughs> Thank you very much. I thought you forgot my You gotta call me Pat something. now then. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on dude. Ukraine, China and North Korea. And uh, Ukraine foreign minister will visit China today at the visitation of uh, Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi. Do you think China can play a role in stopping Russia's uh, aggression against Ukraine? Uh, you know, it's an interesting question, uh, Janie. So, you know, certainly, uh, as I mentioned before, we don't want to see uh, the conflict in Ukraine go on uh, forever. Um, we want to see peace in Ukraine, but it has to come uh, in terms that are acceptable to Ukraine. Uh, you know, no decisions about Ukraine without Ukraine. 
And so uh, China uh, can play a productive role in terms of addressing uh, Russia's malign and illegal activity in Ukraine. Uh, and so certainly if they're able to compel Russia to withdraw its forces uh, and enable the restoration of peace, um, I think that would be a positive development. But, but certainly uh, when it comes to the Ukrainian foreign minister uh, and his conversations with uh, his Chinese counterparts, I'd have to refer you to Ukraine. Another one, uh, the Russian Vice Minister of Defense is visiting North Korea currently. It was also announced that uh, weapons and uh, defense industries uh, were discussed as a follow-up to military cooperation with North Korea and Russia. How can you comment on this? Well, again, it's, it's, uh, it's concerning that we continue to see uh, North Korea and Russia um, further cooperating as it relates to the war in Ukraine. Ag again, as we've said many times, it's demonstrative of the fact that Russia uh, is now having to seek support from countries like Iran and North Korea in order to obtain additional capabilities as they've uh, experienced some logistical challenges. Uh, and so it's something we'll continue to keep a close eye on. Okay, let me come back to the room here. Louis. A um, couple of questions on the coalition that you're referencing. Is that the global coalition against ISIS? Correct. Okay. Um, so the U.S. presence has been acknowledged to be about 2,500 uh, military personnel uh, in whatever capacity inside Iraq. What is the complementary number of troops from the rest of the global coalition? Um, I'd have to to get back to you on that. I, I don't have that number in front of me. Now, you're talking about in Iraq? In Iraq. So yeah, so, so when it comes to uh, the number of, of forces of other countries, um, we, that's something we really let other countries address. So, you know, I'm only gonna speak to the U.S. in that regard. Um, yeah, I'll we'll just leave it there. And so these discussions are specifically about the coalition's presence inside Iraq and not necessarily that the coalition itself uh, will be done or that its mission is complete, correct? Well, again, this is something that the, the Higher Military Commission is looking at, right, in terms of the three factors that I highlighted. What is the threat of ISIS? What are the operational requirements? And then what is the status of the ISF as it relates to being uh, prepared to address the ISIS threat? Uh, and so that's not to say that uh, members of the coalition can't play an important role, whatever that may be as it relates to Iraq's preferences uh, in terms of addressing ISIS. And so um, that's part of those discussions. Um, again, recognizing the fact that it's not just the United States, this is an international coalition that 10 years ago came together to defeat ISIS. And so um, part of this is ensuring that um, ISIS can't resurge we know that they remain committed to resurging, and we know that they remain committed to directing and inspiring attacks. Uh, and so I think it's uh, a, posit a very positive development that the HMC as a forum is able to come together and look at this holistically, also with an eye towards uh, our own U.S.-Iraq bilateral security relationship. And if I could switch gears uh, towards JLOTS, um, since we're close to the 31st, which is the authorization, the end of the authorization date, um, are those um, components now heading back to the U.S., or when can we expect them to? So uh, the JLOTS components are being packed up. Um, I'm not going to, for operation security reasons and, and you know, uh, policy reasons, I'm not going to get into specific redeployment timelines, but, you know, as we briefed, uh, recently, uh, as Admiral Cooper from CENTCOM brief recently, the, the JLOTS mission has concluded. He said mission complete. Well, I'm saying it has concluded. Thank you. Thank you. Jared. So just a, if I could follow up on um, Joe's question, I mean, how concerned is the, the department that these Israeli strikes in Yemen and vice versa could lead to additional escalation, or is there confidence uh, within the department that this is still largely contained? Yeah, so uh, a couple things here. So uh, again, we've always been concerned about regional escalation and remain so, and so we'll continue to do, um, you know, take appropriate steps to deter potential uh, an expansion of regional conflict, you know, both through our force presence, but also importantly through diplomatic means. 
I think you heard the Israelis say they had been targeted by the uh, Houthis over 200 times. Obviously, the vast majority of those uh, attacks were, were taken down through air defense capabilities, uh, and one got through. So we absolutely support their inherent right to defend themselves against these kinds of attacks. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, we will remain focused on trying to prevent a wider regional conflict. Did the U.S. advise the Israelis against striking within Yemen? Uh, look, there was no U.S. involvement uh, in this, in their strike. Uh, again, they gave us uh, advance notice that they were going to do it. Um, I won't go into more detail beyond that other than there was no U.S. involvement and we support their right to defend themselves. Okay, we can take a couple more. Let me go to Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Okay, nothing heard. All right, thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate your time today.